It's been rightly said that the scandal and the greatness of the Christian religion is that it claims that God has revealed himself through the medium of historical facts. And what distinguishes Christianity, what sets it apart from other worldviews, is that there's actually a test by which we can know whether it's true, and that's the resurrection of Jesus. A person can, can go and investigate Christianity, especially the question of the resurrection of Jesus. If they think it happened, they have, they have excellent reason to embrace the entire Christian faith. If Jesus did not come back from the dead, there's not really a solid shred of evidence pointing to that, then you're well within your rights, according to the apostle, to reject Christianity. So Christianity is testable in that respect. You can investigate it because it, it, at its core, it has a certain question that's investigatable. When we look at a historical case for Jesus' resurrection, I think one of the most uh, the best ways of going about this is to take and start off with facts that are so strongly evidenced that uh, they have compelled even the majority of skeptical scholars who studied the subject to grant them as historical. And that kind of suggests that it's not just because a Christian has bias that these things are accepted as true. It means that the historical evidence is true even beyond a person's bias. Let's look at the widely accepted historical facts and see where the evidence points. In order for Jesus to have risen from the dead, three things would need to be true. He would need to be alive at point A, dead at point B, and alive again at point C. And it turns out that the record in history of the existence and the execution of Jesus is incredibly strong. Well, it's become kind of a fad on the internet to claim that Jesus never existed. But this isn't something that is typically held by scholars today. In fact, the number of scholars that would even hold this position, and I'm talking about bona fide scholars who have PhDs in relevant fields um, of like history and biblical studies or religious studies, you wouldn't find more than a handful of them living on earth right now who would deny the existence of Jesus. I mean, probably just as many as who would deny the Holocaust. In the ancient world, if you have two sources for something, two independent sources, that's usually excellent. And a lot of events rest on two sources. A lot of events rest on one, but two's great. Bart Ehrman lists 11 ancient sources for the crucifixion of Jesus. And he says to, to the guys who say he never existed, he goes, how do you deal with 11 sources? If you just do normal history, you can't disprove the fact that, uh, that Jesus died. We have, it's called multiple attestation. We have too many sources, documents, people, not all of them Christian. Virtually every scholar, uh, believer, non-believer, skeptic, uh, concedes that Jesus was executed in uh, the first century, 30 or 33 AD. Um, you get laughed out of a major academic institution if you claimed otherwise. In fact, the atheist um, New Testament scholar, Gerd Ludeman, says Jesus' execution is an indisputable fact. John Dominic Crossan and Marcus Borg, probably next to Bart Ehrman, are the best known skeptics in America. They both say in their own way, in their own works, Borg and Crossan, that the fact that Jesus died by crucifixion is probably the best supported fact in the ancient world. Now, why would they concede that? If they're skeptics and you know they'd like to get a foothold and say the Christian message isn't true, why they say it's the best attested? Because it, it just is. Now, in order to determine whether Jesus was really alive at point C, we need to look at four essential facts. And it's important to understand that the following facts can be established without presupposing that the Bible is God's word. They're a matter of history. They're established by the records of both Christian and non-Christian sources from the ancient world, and they're agreed upon by both Christian and non-Christian historians today. The majority of New Testament historians have come to accept as factual that his body was then interred in a tomb by a member of the Jewish, Jewish Sanhedrin, whose name we actually know, his name was Joseph of Arimathea. He was the man who buried Jesus of Nazareth. 
Secondly, that that tomb was then found empty by a group of Jesus' women disciples on the Sunday morning following the crucifixion. And again, the name of Mary Magdalene is always attached to uh, that account of the discovery of the empty tomb. Thirdly, that thereafter various individuals and groups of people experienced appearances of Jesus alive after his death. And finally, that the original disciples suddenly and sincerely came to believe, despite every predisposition to the contrary, that God had raised Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. Now, some people will say, well, sure, anyone could make that claim. But what we're saying is that they really believed that they saw Jesus. Whether these were hallucinations or not, that's a separate question. But the historical fact is, and this wide spectrum of historians acknowledge that the disciples really believed that they were appeared to by Jesus. So from there, we have to account for what led the disciples and Paul to believe that Jesus had been raised from the dead and had appeared to them, what were these experiences they were having? Now, of course, we can't get into a time machine and return to the past and see what they actually saw to experience what they experienced. But we can look at various options. Some will argue that Jesus' body was stolen. Okay, if Jesus' body was stolen, why would the disciples have genuinely believed he appeared to them if they stole the body? Bigger question yet, why would Paul believe Jesus appeared to him? if the body was just stolen. What explanation is there? How do we interpret the, in, the conversion of Paul and James? How do we interpret those four facts that the wide majority of scholars take for granted? How do we interpret that? Do we interpret that naturally or do we interpret that supernaturally? The next theory that you'll often hear is that they hallucinated, that the disciples who had been with Jesus for so long and spent so much time with him, they really wanted to see Jesus alive. And so they hallucinated. It's a common psychological phenomenon, which is true. People who love others will sometimes see them after they're dead. But 500 at once, and all the disciples, to the point where they were willing to die, it doesn't quite fit. And once again, Paul. What do we do with Paul? Why did Paul hallucinate the risen Jesus? It doesn't make sense. So there are no naturalistic explanations for the resurrection that fit nearly as well as the resurrection itself. There's a lot of problems with hallucinations. Probably no theory has more refutations than hallucinations. For example, the majority of scholars today believe the tomb is empty. But hallucination is a full tomb theory, not an empty tomb theory. If the disciples saw hallucinations, there should have been somebody inside the tomb. Now the problem is you've got to argue for two theories. And the more theories you have to string together to explain these facts, the less plausible uh, it is, the less weight it should carry in causing you to believe one way or the other. Why do many scholars today not conclude in the resurrection is because they unfortunately preclude supernaturalism before they even look at the evidence. Now, if you look at the evidence without precluding supernaturalism, and the best explanation for the events is the resurrection. You know, all the theories about what happened to the body but one have fatal problems. The only problem with the one theory that actually explains it is you have to believe a miracle. But this isn't some random dude in some miscellaneous place that we're saying rose from the dead. It's a person whose coming had been prepared for by providence and predicted by prophecy for 2,000 years. A person whose friends kept asking themselves, what manner of man is this? And being forced to answer it in theistic terms. It's the reassertion of the life of someone who had already shown himself to be sovereign over life and death. If there's ever anybody of whom we could believe that miracle happened, it is this man, it is Jesus of Nazareth.